Hey guys, welcome back to Gearheads Garage. That's right, we're continuing the T-Bucket build, but you may notice a little something different behind me. We finally got our small block Chevy 350 on the cherry picker, so you know what that means for this episode. Now, if you're just joining us, we went all the way from Florida to Nebraska to pick up a Speedway Motors 1923 T-Bucket kit. For this project build here, we're gonna do a small block Chevy 350 with a turbo 350 transmission. Now, if you haven't seen episode one, two, and three, and 3.5, I suggest you jump in right now, get caught up, because we're jumping into episode four-ish right now. Now, again, if you haven't been following the build, you need a little bit of an update. We went all the way to Nebraska, took our happy selves from Florida to pick up the Speedway Motors Deluxe T-Bucket Kit. And well, it was one hell of a drive, but it saved a ton and ton for shipping. But you know, now that I think about it, the money that I actually did save on shipping went into diesel fuel for the truck. So it was more of an experience than anything. So you know how we do it here. We busted out the manual and well, I don't really need a manual to mount a fuel tank, but I do have to say, considering the rest of the manual we've used and how terribly lacking of detail it is, the fuel tank installation part is probably the most detailed section of the manual for this tea bucket, which is actually kind of funny. It's more humorous really, but we don't even need that here. All right, so here's our 14 gallon tank we're gonna use, and I did make some rough measurements over here now that we have more room to work. And then I did pick up this aluminum battery box. It was the cheapest one I could find, 29 bucks. Pretty cool, but even though the mounting tabs are at the top, in the bottom, there's a little ledge right there and we're gonna put it right in there. So again, I took some rough and we're gonna use self-tapping here. I did a lot of reading and um, everybody seems to be using the same thing right here. So I got some inch and a half -ish for some areas as well as some quarter inches to, for some other areas here. Hope I measured these right. So this is almost like a crowning achievement right here of getting the tank in. It's like the most important part, maybe? I don't know. Well, surprisingly, the Dewalt let me down. So we're busting out the cobalt, see what we can get. And same thing over here, self-tapping for a little battery box. So with our AN6 here, I'm just using an AN6 to barb adapter. I'm gonna do hydraulic line. Not all the way to the front, I'll do hard line halfway, but I wanna do tank to AN6 to barb, soft line, whatever. And then that'll take us up front. So a tank would not be complete without the spill valve here. So I got two of these in the box, pretty sweet. Only goes one way. And we'll slap that right in there. And we'll just put it just like that for now. I can always turn it and figure out. I just don't know yet. So the nice part about the tank is it actually comes with a sending unit, a float, and some hardware. So we'll need to put it together. Never put one of these together before. Hmm. I was just looking, I got five holes. I only have like four screws, kind of sucks. Guess we're gonna have to steal hardware from somewhere else. Wow. <laughs> it bottoms out, nice. So I'm kind of dumb here and with some American fine ingenuity, took a pair of clippers there, the clippers up here and shrunk it down even further than what it was originally designed for. So that should go in there and clear. Wow. 
All right guys, so a little bit of a last minute design change here. I went through and drilled the holes in the frame where we're gonna mount the fuel line, but started doing some thinking. I may upgrade the fuel line in the future if I do a blower or fuel injection, and I wanna be able to service it and not have holes where I had self tappers. So we're gonna bust out one of my most hated tools and see if we can use this tap to thread some holes in this frame. Now, if we fail, we'll just use the self tappers and then deal with it later on. So I feel like there's three people in this world. Those who can use a tap, those who can't use a tap, and those who use the self tapper. So if you know a trick to using one of these, put it in the comment section below because getting it started has always been a challenge for me. Yeah, that's my secret to getting it started right there. Power drill. And then finish it off. It works great actually, but again, I'm sure there's an easier way to do this. So I didn't really think this hole out too much here. Um, probably prematurely drilled it and it's way too close to the frame and our tap handle is gonna hit. So we're gonna put it on the end of a power drill, see if we can do it the new fashioned way. So we did already drill that hole and if I fuck it up, we'll just use a self tapper, but we'll keep constant pressure on it and see if we can get something going here. Oh yeah. So I almost thought we beat that terribly hot, humid Florida weather, but it looks like it's come back out of nowhere. So we're just using an insulating clamp here. Nothing too crazy. Slip that over that, and then we're doing our little bolt washer and lock washer. You know, I almost bought that fuel line straightener. Then I didn't want to pay like 50 bucks for it because I thought it was kind of dumb. But now I'm starting to think maybe I should have just bought it. But how many times are you gonna end up using it in life, you know? And then on top here, We'll leave our excess so we can apply that little adapter. I'll show you here that shortly there. So like I said earlier, I sketched a bunch of online pictures of tea buckets and how people are doing their fuel lines. And um, like I said, most people seem to be running them on the bottom of the rail. And I don't know why. It seems like that can get hit by a hazard rock if you're a curb jumper like I am. And it's definitely a big issue, but if you know why, let me know. I'm curious if there's even any benefit in it at all. Now I didn't mention we are doing aluminum fuel line here. So nothing crazy. Now what I'm gonna do here is we'll get this one set in place and I'm gonna leave the wrap still attached without cutting it here. Cause we're gonna drop the motor and see exactly where the fuel pump lines up with that there. Cause I wanna make sure we get the right bend put into it. I just realized I went a little low on that insulator there, but pretty happy with the way it turned out there. Pretty good for a first time, I think, pretty straight. We'll add a few others in here, maybe up there, and then another one kind of up here at an angle, depending on how we route that there. All right guys, so we're nearing the end of our big purchases and now we're kind of diving into small stuff here and there to kind of finish up the loose ends of the project. Somebody asked me if I'm gonna to put together a list towards the end of everything if you're thinking about doing the Speedway project. Damn right I'm going to because nobody else has done it yet. So I'll put that up for you guys, but let's dive into the box and see what we have because we're gonna be installing a majority of this. So the first thing we have here, well actually I really don't know, I'm only guessing is our drive shaft. And well, there's something funny about this one here because I looked everywhere online to try to see if I could get a 16 inch drive shaft and not have to buy it from Speedway to save me money. And well, this was the cheapest one I could find. And it came with pretty much all the parts, the yoke for the Turbo 350 and pretty much everything that you need. And then with the drive shaft, you actually get the yoke 
for the Turbo 350 transmission. Yeah, there you go. Nice and clean machine. Yeah, that's from another box too. I'm a hoarder. I start throwing stuff in the random boxes and lose track. So I'm doing a hydraulic braided fuel line. Essentially, it's just a push on. It's pretty good quality stuff. And actually, it was cheaper than going to AutoZone for this. Universal joints, bunch of other random stuff in here. Nothing too crazy, just random hardware. But this is the one that I was waiting on because I couldn't really figure out a good color scheme for the T-bucket. Now, I did go with a flat black headlight housing. And this is about the cheapest one I could find. And when I say cheap, I mean, they feel kind of cheap and it was scuffed up here. So I may bust out the powder coater, sand it down and, and repowder coat these, but I'm not gonna go with a normal halogen light. Let me show you what I'm gonna go to because what I have in the motorcycle is the exact fit from Harley Davidson for these. Let me show you the Harley headlight here. Cause the Harley has the same seven inch and I'm gonna do this multi LED system on the T-Bucket. I think it'll look amazing. And you can get these for about 30 bucks. They're pretty sweet. So there's nothing more exciting than finally putting that fitting on. And we went with a little bit of a quick attach and six slash kind of self crimps onto the three H fuel line. It's a very interesting item. I was told by many that this is a super popular option for the fuel lines. They recommended against using it with fuel injection, but they said people do it. And you know, if people are doing it, that means it's working. So, put that on there. And it should. Hmm. There, we'll put that right there. That goes on. I'm hoping that this angle is not too extreme because I still have to come off with another 90 and then go down. So maybe a little interesting setup, or I may just have to do a 90 out and over from there off the fuel tank. So this should, let's get ourselves a wrench and hopefully I don't find a way to fuck it up. So we're going to end up doing the same thing up here as well. Again, we're leaving this coiled for now because we're going to drop the motor, all that cool, fun stuff, and we'll tuck this away so we don't bend it. But we'll trim it. We'll add that same adapter we just used, and then we'll run it to the fuel pump itself on the block. All right, guys, so I know this is the part that most of you all have been waiting for. Nobody really cares about the frame. They're only interested in the motor drop, and that's probably the most important part about this entire build. But... If you didn't catch episode one, two, three, or whatever we're on right now, I picked up this motor off Facebook Marketplace. It's like 16 or 1700 bucks from some guy who had built it and he was selling it with a C10. I wasn't interested in the C10, just wanted the motor. But he ended up throwing in a bunch of stuff, which I have an entire shelf in the back with tons and tons of parts. But we're not gonna use any for that build, maybe a future build. But it was a really awesome deal. It's a 69 small block Chevy 350. I checked the casting on it and all that fun stuff. Now, after I got this motor back home from when I bought it, I noticed that the two freeze plugs back here were not installed. They've been cleaned out and ready to go, but it pretty much looks like the guy actually didn't finish the job. So we're gonna install some bone stock dry, no Permatex, no nothing. And uh, yeah, I know everybody has their own way of doing things. And if it leaks, I guess you can say I told you so, or well, you know, tell me so, and we'll have to do a video of us tearing it out of the tea bucket once it's all installed and leaking everywhere. So we're using the original flywheel, and contrary to all the cool parts we bought, it is a budget build, and uh, kind of wanted to save the $50 and not have to buy another one of these. That was about the cheapest one I could find. But this should do all right. It is the original from the 60s, and if it's made it this far, I don't see why we can't get another couple years out of it. Well, if it breaks, then whatever, we'll replace it. Just a little bit to get it started.
All right, GM says 65 pounds-ish. I'm just going with the Jegs gear reduction. It's actually made in the USA. I was actually really happy to see that. Super surprised. And it was really cheap. But we do need to check some fitment and see if we need to shim this thing here. So I don't know yet. We'll engage the pinion. Once we get this thing to stay up here. Again, all this probably should have been done on the actual cradle, but whatever. We do things the hard way on this channel. All right. Well, I can already tell that's not gonna work just by looking at it and not even pulling out the pinion here. It's so far deep into the wheel here. So we'll pull that off and shim it. It did come with a few shims. So hopefully that'll set us back. And then we do have shims for the mounting plate as well there. We got our one shim in right here. We do have an extra one. And then we didn't end up using the mount shim here, but we'll look at that here in a second. Cause I think we'll be good, but let's check the teeth and see. Yeah, we're way too tight. It's still binding up in there. Yeah, way too much. So let's add another shim. Well, that didn't go as how I planned it to be. So shim two, and we should be able to fit a little paper clip in there. Right, well, we're looking good there. We'll spin it around and check it a few more times. I'm surprised it used two. We ended up not having used a back spacer there. I'm starting to think I probably should have replaced that, but just didn't want to spend the money. But we're looking good here. Engagement is pretty good as well, so very, very happy with that. But that's not it on the motor here. Now we need to address the engine mount situation. So for the motor mount situation, we actually had to get some smaller ones like I mentioned in episode two. They're considering these to be the old style mount, these considering the new style. We'll also get a new bolt here, but yeah, this one's pretty huge. Now compared down to here, when I did do a test fit, I was so concerned originally because I was like, wow, they didn't weld the right bungs on the here, but then I found out again that there's two different styles of engine mounts. So yeah, that'll work perfectly there. So we'll pull these old suckers off and drop them in the parts bin. As when I purchased this block here, um, there was no fuel pump. And uh, so I picked up probably the cheapest one I could find, uh, $32, can you believe that? So we'll see how long it lasts, but so I noticed a lot of guys will put RTV around this area in here and then mount the fuel pump. I'm not really too sure why, considering that nothing about this area is pressurized, nothing. I guess maybe for those that are digging down deep in the rivers and submerging their motors and all that fun stuff. Um, but I've seen some crazy videos of people just lathering this area up. So we're just gonna use some blue Loctite on the bolts some good gaskets and put that right up there. So the next thing we can do here is we can go ahead and pull this bolt we put in here out. And then that push rod will actually end up dropping down. So we're trying to future-proof the fuel system essentially, right? So if we ever upgrade the motor, blow, or any of that stuff, for the fuel pump, we're gonna use an AN6 adapter within a push-on as well for the MPT fitting. So nothing crazy, but in the future, I'll be able to remove one and essentially do a hard line if we ever actually upgrade to fuel injection. So pretty simple here with these two. Essentially, one will go in the fuel pump, and then the next one will have just an adapter like that so we can do our push-on hydraulic hose for our fuel pump. So I'm calling it a future proof because in the future, again, we just remove this 
make ourselves an AN6 hard line and then route it back up if we end up doing like a sniper system or a blower. All right guys, so torque converter, ready to put this sucker on. Ended up getting a new one. Uh, the old one, I tipped it over, had water in it. I never left it outside, so I'm assuming it's from the Chevelle that the transmission was pulled out of. But I think somebody actually left the torque converter sitting outside. I'm not really too sure. So as a good form of insurance and not having to pull everything apart again, even though we half-assed a bunch of stuff on the motor, hopefully this cheap torque from Jegs will work. It's a 22 to 2600, I think, and doesn't really rattle on the inside. So let's fill her up. See how much of a mess we can make. You know, they say that you can install these dry, but I don't know. You run the risk, right? So we'll allow the air bubbles to kind of work out of that before we put it on. All right, and because my neighbor didn't come over and help me out with this, I'm stuck having to do this the rigged way. That cinder block on here. We want to bring it up just a little higher and then pick this up just like that. So that'll help us align it to the back of the motor there. Pretty sure there's a O ring that goes there. I don't know. Maybe not. Damn, this thing's heavier when it's got fluid in it. Problem with filling these up with fluid is they literally leak all over the place. Let's see if we can pull this off here. Make this happen just like that. So we'll lower this just a little bit. Probably shouldn't walk underneath that. Damn, almost close. Well, that went a lot easier than I thought it was going to go. So the torque spec on this doesn't really call for too much. I think it was like 30 or so. 35. All right. All right. It wasn't as hard as I thought it was gonna be. It's time to lift it up though. So we're gonna make like a 300 point turn here and hopefully, eventually, we get it through. I've done a lot of dangerous things in my life, but I think this one might top the cake here. Now that I look more at it, I think I need to move the jack stands probably to over to the engine cradle area. Man, it's hot out here. Oof. I have no idea how I ended up with longer bolts than I needed here because I legit took measurements before I bought these damn things. And they're fucking too long. 
So we still have a lot that actually needs to be done as well as drive shaft installation, finishing out battery, all that fun stuff. And there's still a lot of plumbing that needs to be done. But I did notice one thing wrong with the motor. Well, not really wrong, but let's take a look. So this fuel pump here is like amazingly, <laughs> look how close that is there. I don't know if they make a low profile or a smaller one. I'll have to do a little bit of research on that. But again, I don't, I don't know. I don't actually know if it's touching. Not ready to put my head underneath this thing yet because it's not 100% secure. But let's talk about some of the other stuff that we need to do as well because that's not it. There's just so much more that we got to knock out. So let's jump back to the rear diff here really quick. So in our last episode, I never actually mentioned, but I ran into a small issue with the rear diff after the installation. I found that the ring here, the dust cap cover, was actually loose. I reached out to Speedway. One of their suggestions was for me to weld it. And I told them for the price that I paid for the rear diff, well, the third member itself, I don't need to be welding anything at this point. So they ended up sending me a replacement. So we'll be installing that one in the next episode as well. This one's actually been pushed on and pressed on. And if you can look closely, it looks like it's actually been TIG welded very slightly. So if you remember, I told you I chose the cheapest battery box I could find. And well, it's probably the cheapest. Just two rods is all that holds everything together. And just a cast aluminum lid for the top. So we'll loosely fit everything together. I'm notorious for losing hardware. So we'll do that. That'll go just like that here. Wow, it barely clears the AN6 outlet on the fuel tank. So it's probably like the simplest design in the world, but yeah, that's it. That's the only thing that's holding the stop on the bottom, but they're not cheap feeling by no means. So thread to the bottom. But this is going to be a close one, especially on this. Once this is up with the battery on it, let me show you this. So this was really the only way to mount the tank. And there's the outlet right there for it. So if you look at where the battery box is going to be, this is going to be one hell of a tight fit with that right there. So I don't want to shift it over, but we'll make a better decision or a more informed decision on the battery itself so it clears. Or maybe we'll actually do a 90 here. I think I talked about doing a 90 so it comes straight out. And then we're only going right there. We're not going very far at all. So dunk, dunk, dunk. And then we'll pull that down just a little bit once we finally do our final adjustment. So maybe it's not as close to the frame and, and vibrating on the frame there. Well, gearheads, that's all I got in this episode four for you. We did make some serious progress on the T-Bucket build, so I'm very, very happy about that. And everything went together really good. No cutting, no grinding, no modifications to the motor, any of that, or really anything at all. We did get some other parts, so let's talk about that. So I'll leave you with it for episode five. Now, we still got a boatload of stuff to install, which I showed you guys that drive shaft, uh, universal joints, all that stuff for the bucket on the next one. And then we got our T-bucket radiator that finally came in. So we'll hopefully get that hooked up too in our next episode as well as plumbed and all that fun stuff. I am going to eventually dress up the motor a little bit. I don't like the valve covers or any of that stuff. So that's going to be more towards the end of our build here. So gearheads, as we move closer to actually working with the T-bucket here, give me some suggestions in the comment section on what we should do. I'm thinking about a charcoal black, but a lot of people have done black. And I'm thinking about doing something that's absolutely insanely crazy that nobody else has done because I don't like the wash thing. So I'm thinking about a rhino lining on this. <laughs> what do you think? Leave it in the comments. Well, gearheads, that's it for episode four on our build. Don't forget, hit the like and subscribe. I do post updates, shorts, all that fun stuff for the channel on the community tab on YouTube. So don't forget, check that periodically. As well as I just launched a Facebook page for the channel to give you guys some other updates. So Facebook's your thing. I'll put the link in the description below. I'll see you for episode five and we'll see what it brings us.